Anyway, let's get rolling here. Uh, this is the title slide that you see here. That work is from Albert Glaze, Albert Glaze, I should say, since he's French, called Harvest Threshing. As you can imagine, we're going to be talking about the art movement Cubism a little bit today. In the fall of 1935, Hemingway published The Green Hills of Africa, an account of his first safari in East Africa. In it, he discusses his writing, his goal in writing, and he wrote a very odd thing in that book. Now, this is in fragmented sentences, so I apologize, but it's his writing. He says, the kind of writing that can be done. How far prose can be carried if anyone is serious enough and has luck. There is a fourth and fifth dimension that can be gotten. Now, what in the world was Hemingway talking about? Fourth and fifth dimensions? What in the world is that? That doesn't make much sense, at least probably to most of us. Well, I went and Googled it up, starting with the fourth dimension, and I found this definition. The fourth dimension is a place you can travel. Now, now put on your thinking caps here and lean into these words, okay? The fourth dimension is a place you can travel by going in a direction perpendicular to the third dimension. Now, let me repeat that. <laughs> The fourth dimension is a place you can travel by going in a direction perpendicular to the third dimension. Now well, that sounds simple enough. Just go perpendicular to the third dimension. So let's all try that. Go ahead and try to imagine going perpendicular to the third dimension right now. Just try it. My guess is that this little exercise has already given some of you a headache. So let's try again. We'll have to imagine an object. So let's think about a cube, a quintessential third dimensional object. Imagine one in your mind, a cube. Now imagine that cube extending from one side and bending so that you could see all of its sides. Now with that image in mind, imagine all the sides of the cube extending out and bending so that you could see all of its sides. Just imagine that. Now, it would be quite a feat if we could imagine a cube bending from all of its six sides, but our brains are not designed for four dimensions, which is what I've described. We can only perceive in three dimensions. Or can we? Where did this strange idea of the fourth dimension and fifth dimension come from? This guy, Albert Einstein's experimental imaginings of time's effect on three-dimensional space led to the idea, confirmed later, that gravity bends space and slows or speeds up time. It literally bends space and slows or speeds up time. This is from space.com. Einstein's theory of special relativity says that time slows down or speeds up depending on how fast you move relative to something else. Approaching the speed of light, a person inside a spaceship would age much slower than his twin at home. Also, under Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity can bend time. Picture a four-dimensional fabric called space-time. When anything that has mass sits on that piece of fabric, it causes a dimple or a bending of space-time. The bending of space-time causes objects to move on a curved path, and that curvature of space is what we know as gravity. Simple enough. <laughs> well, here's an image that describes the bending of space-time. This idea means that there are more than three dimensions to our space-time continuum. Now, I still had difficulty imagining a fourth or fifth dimension, even though mentally I knew it existed. So I continued looking around various sites, hoping to find one which would help me imagine the fourth dimension. Now, I'm, please humor me, because you're probably wondering, what in the world is he doing talking about fourth dimension? <laughs> just stay with me here just a little bit longer. 
So on this site, there was described a method for getting to the fourth dimension by starting from a zero dimension and working our way forward. We start with a point. Okay, that is a zero dimension. Then we draw a horizontal line, which gives us one dimension. We draw a vertical line, and there we have two dimensions. Now, in order to get three dimensions, we have to draw a line indicating depth. So the most basic object we come up with for understanding three dimensions is the cube that I used before. But now what? We need to imagine cubes extending perpendicular to all sides of the cube and be able to see them all at once. But that's impossible since we only perceive in three dimensions. Well, we have to use our three-dimensional perception to imagine a four-dimensional object, which scientists have done. The object that they came up with is this one. It's called a tesseract. Now, for those who are really geeky about this sort of thing and want to explore it more, there's a wonderful YouTube video of Carl Sagan explaining the fourth dimension using a tesseract if you want to uh, receive a better explanation than one that I gave. Now, some of you may think by now that I'm just cruel, presenting the idea of a fourth dimension. As I said before, stay with me a little longer. Is it possible to imagine four-dimensional objects as they really are from a fourth-dimensional perspective? Some intellectuals, artists, and seekers around the turn of the last century thought so and even attempted to do so. Now, why would they risk blowing valuable neural transmitters in such an imaginative experiment? Because their hearts were restless. And as St. Augustine put it, our hearts are not at rest until they find their rest in thee. Remember the time period of the lost generation and recall from last week F. Scott Fitzgerald's description of this generation here was a new generation shouting the old cries, learning the old creeds through a reverie of long days and nights, destined finally to go out into that dirty gray turmoil, World War I, to follow love and pride. A new generation dedicated more than the last to the fear of poverty and, and the worship of success. Here's the key phrase, grown up to find all gods dead, all wars fought, all faiths in man shaken, all gods dead, all wars fault, all faiths in man shaken. This generation experienced a profound loss of meaning. Seekers tried to imagine the fourth dimension because that meant they had to see from a different place than the three-dimensional physical realm. They had to see from a metaphysical place, a spiritual place. And so seeking the fourth dimension came to represent a quest for the spiritual realm, a quest for the ultimate, the place of true meaning, a quest for God, if I may put it that way. Remember from last week our discussion of Gertrude Stein and her salon as a kind of axis for the lost generation's aspirations. Her college mentor, the professor William James here on the left, tried to apply these ideas about a fourth dimension to psychology. In particular, he applied them to the phenomena of aesthetic and spiritual experience. He believed that people who had profound spiritual or clairvoyant experiences for that matter, were perceiving from a different dimension. Now you may be thinking, what does this heady material really have to do with art? Well, these ideas form the philosophical grounding for one of the major art movements in history, Cubism. The French mathematician Maurice Pince, Prince, excuse me, was known as the mathematician of Cubism because he mingled with the avant-garde artists of Paris like Pablo Picasso and poet and art critic Guillaume Apollinaire and other artists like Max Jacob and Marcel Duchamp. Well, one afternoon, Prince visited Picasso and other Cubists at the Bateau Lavoir, which is where they lived. Prince introduced Picasso to Esprit Jouvray's elementary treatise on the geometry of four dimensions, which came out in 1903. The diagram on the left is from that book. 
This work described hypercubes and other complex polyhedra in four dimensions and projected them onto the two-dimensional page. And Picasso was fascinated by the ideas presented in this book. Pablo Picasso's portrait of Daniel Henry Conweiler, which you see on the right, completed in 1910, was an important work for the artist who spent many months shaping it. The portrait bears similarities to Jouffre's work and shows a distinct movement away from the proto-cubism, uh, the fauvism, I guess, displayed in Les Desmoiselles d'Avignon, you see on the left, into a more experimental analysis of space and form. Take a look at the transition in cubism for a second. Now, does it surprise any of you that Picasso was reading such heady scientific and philosophical material? Well, artists, the great ones, are some of the most well-read people you will ever meet. Artists by, are, by nature are explorers, and not simply explorers of experience, they're explorers of ideas, because to them, ideas are experience. This is one reason I push people to experience more art in their lives, because by looking at art, by reading poetry and literature, by watching innovative films, one experiences profound ideas, even if unawares they are absorbing such ideas. And over time, with the repeated exposure, our minds, as well as our hearts and our souls, will become more elastic and open to such higher concepts. Early cubist Max Weber, who painted this work titled Athletic Contest, actually wrote an article entitled In the Fourth Dimension from a Plastic Point of View for Alfred Stieglitz's July 1910 issue of Camera Work. And you remember Alfred Stieglitz, right? The husband of Georgia O'Keeffe. In the piece, Weber states, in plastic art, I believe, there is a fourth dimension which may be described as the consciousness of a great and overwhelming sense of space magnitude in all directions at one time and is brought into existence through the three known measurements. That's kind of a mouthful right there, <laughs> and it's a headful as well. Now, the place where these artists gathered and where their cubist experiments with the fourth dimension could be seen and discussed was Gertrude Stein's home, where she hosted weekly salons. Naturally, the salon of Gertrude Stein came to be like a little laboratory for exploring ideas such as the fourth dimension. And at these salons, Ernest Hemingway, along with poets and writers of various stripes, mingled with Picasso, Weber, and other cubists discussed these ideas, and tried to apply them to their own writing. The Cubist works show what it would be like to see an object from various perspectives all at once. Time would have to slow down for that to happen, or even stand still. And that is the experience these artists were trying to express, not only visually, but in the case of Hemingway and Stein herself, in writing as well. In so doing, they are trying to be conduits of spirit. There is an article on Wikipedia specifically on the fourth dimension in visual art, and I encourage you to look it up if you want to examine this material more deeply. Here is a quote from that article from the French poet Guillaume Apollinaire, who knew almost every artist and writer of significance in Paris around the time of World War I. Guillaume Apollinaire writes, until now, the three dimensions of Euclid's geometry were sufficient to the restiveness felt by great artists yearning for the infinite. The new painters do not propose any more than did their predecessors to be geometers, but it may be said that geometry is to the plastic arts what grammar is to the art of the writer. Today, scientists no longer limit themselves to three dimensions, of Euclid, the painters have been led quite naturally, one might say, by intuition, to preoccupy themselves with the new possibilities of spatial measurement, which, in the language of the modern studios, are designated by the term 
the fourth dimension. Wishing to attain the proportions of the ideal, to be no longer limited to the human, the young painters offer us works which are more cerebral than sensual. They discard more and more the old art of optical illusion and local proportion in order to express the grandeur of metaphysical forms. This is why contemporary art, even if it does not directly stem from specific religious beliefs, nonetheless possesses some of the characteristics of great, that is to say, religious art. Here's an example of her experiments in writing, Gertrude Stein's, that is, from her book of poetry, Tender Buttons, which was her attempt to write like the Cubists painted. Now, you're going to have to humor me again because this is going to sound really strange. A carafe, that is, a blind glass. A kind in glass and a cousin, a spectacle and nothing strange, a single hurt color and an arrangement and a system to pointing. All this and not ordinary, not unordered in not resembling. The difference is spreading. <laughs> Just take a moment to read that again, okay? <laughs> Before I move on. All right. Enough of the torture. Let's take a closer look at what at first may seem mere gibberish. A kind in glass simply means a carafe is a type of glass, just like any bottle is. It is cousin to many types of glass, including eyeglasses, which are spectacles. However, the title says the carafe is a blind glass, perhaps because it is filled with a liquid described as a single hurt color. So maybe it is filled with red wine, which is the color of a bruise or blood. It is arranged in a system to pointing. Well, imagine a cubist painting of a bottle where you have various angles of the object presented at once, which creates several points. She has fragmented the carafe, in other words, so that it appears in various arrangements with points. It also must be a uniquely styled carafe because she describes it as unordered and not resembling. And the difference is spreading. Spreading as in various perspectives, which are all different, are bent outward onto a two-dimensional plane as in a cubist painting. Now, that was some work, wasn't it? In the Atlantic Monthly in 1935, Gertrude Stein denied being influenced in her writing by the idea of the fourth dimension. What she has done in this description of a carafe, however, is present in, in only three sentences, is present numerous perspectives of a carafe, just like Picasso's Cubist paintings. Her approach is more of an intellectual experience than a pure sensational one. But even if such works sound like nonsense, it had a significant impact on writers like Hemingway and others because it encouraged them to experiment, to challenge the idea that the experience of time and writing was purely linear. In an interview for the Transatlantic in 1946 with Robert Bartlett, Haas, Stein reflected back on these days of experimentation saying, I don't know if I have that, I don't have that slide. She said, I used to take objects on a table like a tumbler or any kind of object and try to get the picture of it clear and separate in my mind and create a word relationship between the word and the things seen. Now here are a couple of examples of perhaps more accessible poetry from members of the lost generation attempting to convey the fourth and fifth dimension in their work by creating sensations through powerful imagery. In a station of the metro. Uh, could somebody, uh, Azda, could you let uh, Lisa in? She's in the waiting room. Azda, can you hear me? I don't see her. Oh, maybe because you redid the Zoom. Oh, maybe so. Um, let's see. Let, let me escape right now real quick and admit her. Sorry about that. And I'll continue my playing. Can you all still see my screen okay? 
Yeah. That's not? Okay, cool. Lisa, welcome. Sorry, you're a little late here. We're just finishing up. We start at nine o'clock now, so sorry about that. Um, but we will have a replay recorded. In a Station of the Metro by Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound served as a mentor to Hemingway and used to accompany him to Gertrude Stein's salons. Here is one of his most famous poems, written in the Japanese haiku style, which attempted to convey, through a description of the physical world, a sense of the ethereal. In the station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. What's happening here? Pound is in a metro station and sees a crowd of people, or more specifically, the faces of these people. He immediately draws a connection to what he has seen in nature, the many blossoms on the dark branch of a tree. The tree is described as wet. Why? Because it glistens as the dark metal of a train glistens in the light of a metro station. Notice that Pound does not use the metaphorical words is like. The apparition of these faces in the crowd is like petals on a wet black bough. Using such words would, in our imaginations, put the two images, one from urban life and the other from the natural world, next to one another in a comparison. But eliminating the words is like puts the two images on top of one another, fusing them so that we see both in an instant of time, or at least that was his attempt. The apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. We are in a Paris metro station and looking at a blossoming tree simultaneously. Now let's look at another example from poetry that I have used before another presentation, so it will be familiar, I think, to many of you. The Red Wheelbarrow, William Carlos Williams' most famous poem. He was also a contemporary of Hemingway and Pound and other members of the Lost Generation. It reads, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Let me read it again. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Here we have another rich image that if we were walking by a farm, we might see and absorb in an instant of time. And yet the poem begins with the words, so much depends. These words imply that we have taken time to contemplate the aesthetically powerful image of a glistening red wheelbarrow next to white chickens. But our experience of the poem is most likely that we sense the profundity of the image the moment we finish the poem. In other words, time has slowed down, perhaps stood still again for some of you when reading the poem. Now recall that Hemingway and Green Hills of Africa mentioned not only the fourth, but the fifth dimension. Well, the fifth dimension has been defined by P.D. Upinski, a uh, Uspensky, excuse me, a pseudo-philosopher-scientist that Stein was probably familiar with, he defined it as simply the eternal now. The eternal now. Some of you who have studied Hindu philosophy will probably be familiar with the term the eternal now. It's a moment of bliss. In other words, when time not only stands still, as in the fourth dimension, but time ceases to exist altogether. This is the experience only of a god I suppose, or some highly trained Indian gurus. I can appreciate Hemingway's ambitions, but this seems a bit lofty, especially for a writer. But I believe these artistic attempts at a fourth and fifth dimensional experience are valuable for us in any way, for they are an invitation to enter the mystical world the realm of the spirit. And I know that many of you, if not all of you, when looking at art or reading poetry or literature, have experienced at one time, even a fleeting, moments resonant with spiritual profundity because your perspective was altered to such a degree that time seemed to stand still. And friends, that is why we need more, to experience more art in our life 
to remind us that there is a more to our everyday three-dimensional existence. Art keeps us seeking that more. It keeps us restlessly seeking because our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee.